it's time to get working on the river section. So this needs to be um, recessed, I guess, in, in order to make the river flow. I'm going to over recess it and then build the bank up and the, the bottom of the river with some sculptor mold so that it's nice and firm um, and can take textures and things on top but the majority of the work to get this material out can't be done with a knife because trying to dig curves with a knife is almost impossible so there's two options um, one that I have and will be using is a heat gun um, because this melts the foam and you can do it in a controlled way. The further away you are, uh, the less it melts. You can get up close and melt quite a lot. People do use blow torches, but I don't have one. Or well, those little mini chef's torches, but they seem quite dangerous as an option. This is done less likely to set anything on fire. Um, if you don't have a heat gun, although they're not that expensive, unless you've got multiple uses for one, I wouldn't go out and buy one. I would just get some nail polish remover um, or acetone if you have it. But this is usually the most easiest way of getting it. Boots in the UK is a pharmacy, so it's very easy for us to go in and buy it. Um, and I've got a sacrificial paint paintbrush here. Um, it needs to have natural bristles so that this doesn't dissolve the bristles, but I don't know what it's going to do to the glue inside the ferrule. So uh, using a brush that if it, if it dies uh, is not a big issue. So I've laid the bridge out on the board where it's going to go, and there's two things to consider here. One, I need to leave enough um, foam for me to put down another piece of card on top, or plastic card, to take the weight of the bridge because the foam won't. And in the middle, I want to have something for these, this part of the bridge to stand on. So what I'm going to do is leave like a little island in the middle of the river. I think the easiest thing to do is going to be to hollow out the entire river and then build back up with a piece of foam and some sculptor mould the ridge in the middle. Maybe put a rock in there that it sits on for the foundation. And that way I can set it. Um, so that I push the bridge down onto it and leave it to set and it will be exactly the right height for the bridge going forward. So that's my plan. Um, I'm going to get started, probably put it on a time lapse um, with a voiceover to see how we do with getting all of this um, melted away to reveal the river. Okay, I'm going to start here with the nail polish just to give you an idea of how it goes. I put some in a little cap so I can get to it. This is the cap from a spray can because it's a type of plastic that won't react with the nail polish. And what you can see if I put it on here is that it will start to dissolve the foam and melt it away. So you can be fairly controlled with this because you can paint it on in layers as you need to. You can see it's deforming the foam there. This does create some unpleasant fumes, so don't do it in the house. Um, do it in the garage with a respirator on or in the garden. And you can see that it's melting the foam. So if you need to get a large amount out, you can pour very small amounts on, but it's very dangerous to do so because it could melt the foam super quickly. So it gives you an idea of what you can do at home, um, but I'm going to now press on with using the heat gun. I'm going in with the heat gun to melt the plastic. Do this in a ventilated area or preferably outside or use a respirator like I did. Right, the air's cleared in the garage, which is good. And this is all nice and cooled down now. So you can see that it's hollowed out the river shape really, really well. Um, here I've left the banks a little steeper, so I'm probably doing them a bit rockier where the water comes out of a cave in the cliff face. Um, here things will be smoothed out a little bit more, and here I'll use the sculptor mold to smooth the transition into the uh, tiles that form the dock and canal area. Um, a few bits have broken off where I've under, gone over the underhang, uh, overhang, sorry, but that's not an issue because, again, the sculptor mold will fill that in, but the rest of it... It's pretty hard now that the surface layer has essentially been melted and has set into like a film, which is great. And it's very textured, uh, which is going to be perfect for the sculptor mold to grip onto. So what I will do is I will actually be using the heat gun um, across the rest of the piece after I've done this river to kind of make the surface uneven across everything. What it will do is it will leave the surface at the same height uh, where the boards join. I mean, these are actually better matched. It's my uneven tables here. Um, and so that you won't notice the seams so much, but each piece will have its own undulations to kind of vary the, the texture appearance. And what I'll have to do here is I will have to actually get a knife out or possibly my Dremel tool and cut away uh, where the two pieces join together so there isn't this line down the middle. When I pour resin in there, um, ideally I'll be able to get the two pieces to match up. I might put a couple of rocks here. They're really good for hiding the joints in pieces. Um, and then everything should fit together nicely. Okay, moving on to making the hills now. And in order that everything lines up nicely to have the boards modular and be able to move along, I've got all my edge pieces for the hills cut uh, to the same length. And these will be stuck alongside here um, to box in 
uh, the area for the foam to go and then the front will undulate with the cliffs but they will always end up against these pieces so that they are the same size and can match across. What I'm going to do is stick these down on here so I've got a, two long pieces and then a short piece here. Uh, they'll be boxing in the foam which I'll then stick in place with the expanding Gorilla Glue and what I've got to do this is a fast setting uh, super glue. So I've got um, a bottle of regular super glue um, and this spray setter. So you can buy this with a bottle of its own glue um, for about five pounds in the UK. Uh, this goes a long, 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 long way. And there's something like 50 grams of glue in the bottle. So it'd be a very, very large amount of glue for a table like this and just right. It means that I can put the glue on the piece, spray the, um, the setting agent on here, push the two pieces together, and within five seconds, I'll be able to let go and it'll be completely set. So I'll be able to do the outside very quickly. Um, gives me a chance to line it up, hold it till it sets, and then nothing should come apart. So I can get the foam pieces inside and the glue setting. So let's see how this goes. So I'm applying the super glue to the long edge, spraying the activator on the receiving edge and pressing the two together. Within two or three seconds, it grabs. And then I ran a little bit of super glue in the joints just to hold everything firmly together. Right, that's all set up quite nicely. I will peel off this green protective tape when I'm done. It's got good strength already. It's bonded nicely along this side and here. So what I need to do now is fill in the gap with foam. So what I've got here is my uh, Gorilla Glue. This is the polyurethane expanding glue. I've got a little spray bottle of water that I use with it to help it set. I've got my off cuts from when I cut these board sections in the first place. I kept them because they're great for putting in here. And I've got a craft knife or utility knife. Uh, this is the Alpha brand one. Um, it's a little bit more expensive than your average knife. I bought it on a recommendation from Black Magic Craft, Jeremy, and it is the best utility knife I've ever bought. It's got a locking mechanism here so the blade doesn't move, and then you can very easily retract it. So it's super safe as well, and it's razor sharp. Um, so what I'm going to do is fill in the gaps with these pieces of foam. So this one is pretty close fit here. So I'll get the glue on it to get it in place, trim it across here, stuff a little bit of other offcuts that I've kept along the way in this gap, and then make sure it's nice and flat at the front. Put a weight on top because this glue expands ever so slightly. Not a lot, but enough that if I don't, it will rise up ever so slightly or go wonky. So best to weigh it down in place and uh, then give it uh, three or four hours for the glue to properly cure and uh, you're good to go to any other work you want to do. So I'm applying the Gorilla Glue to the pieces that I've cut up and sticking them in all the different gaps to kind of fill in the space. It doesn't matter with these if they're made up of lots of individual pieces. Overall, it'll have strength once I put the sculpt mold over the top. Uh, you'll never even know there's loads and loads of different clumps all stuck together. Time to dress the cliff faces with the um, rock moulds. I've cast up a whole bunch of these in either casting plaster that I've got or plaster of Paris is fine for this sort of thing. And I'm going to stick them onto here with some sculptor mould. I'm going to go in first with a few dabs of the Gorilla Glue just to make sure that everything binds completely. And I'm going to make sure that these pieces um, here are the same height as the uh, outer frame of plastic so that everything lines up. But what goes on here, up to me to, to make it work as I need to. I will make the two sides of the cave area and once they're all set and dry, I'll then put a piece behind to close off the cave and I'm gonna put a few pieces down here and start putting some sculptor mold bits along the river to get everything smoothed over. So let's get rolling. I applied my Gorilla Glue and sculpt mold as planned, but some of the pieces at the edge, these little ones that form the borders, uh, wouldn't quite hold in place. Um, so I stuck them down with a tiny bit of super glue first, just so it'll hold them while everything else sets up. Okay, so I've got the first stage done. I like to do this in two stages, though you can one shot everything if you uh, feel confident, but I like to let things dry and then tart it up afterwards. So it's quite rough and ready here, but the plaster's already started to set in the sculptor mold holding all these pieces quite firmly in place. Uh, tomorrow I'll put a bridge piece of foam in here and put some rock moulds on here. So you've got a nice little cave entrance. I've got some rocks set into the riverbed. I've used the sculptor mould and the smoothing that I showed before to make sure the riverbed has got a nice shape to it uh, with the occasional uh, rocky bulge here where there's a, a turn in the river and there's some pieces I'll pan across here uh, where the bridge um, has these pieces that it needs to sit on and needs something underneath to support it that makes sense. So I've got some rocks here. 
Where you have gaps like this, um, I do have a lot of small pieces that come off these molds, so whereas one like this, that you can snap them and just rough up the edge and kind of fill in the gaps. Um, or what you can do is just get a little bit of plaster on a popsicle stick um, and smear it in the gap, let it partially set up. And if you scrape it with a metal tool, you get kind of like a rough rocky texture, which looks good enough to hide uh, where everything joins up. By the time you wash it, paint it, uh, get all the ground covers on, you really wouldn't notice any join there anyway. And I've clad the um, other supporting part of the bridge in this here, and I've got right up until here. So what I need to do is I need to butt up the entrance to the city piece and then cut them both to be the same here, and then I'll smooth everything out afterwards. So I need them to be exactly aligned so that they match up. But overall, gone fairly well. Um, the next stage is, like I say, is going to be kind of filling in all these gaps and getting everything looking good. And then I've got to do this across the four other tiles. As long as these, as I mentioned earlier, these edges kind of line up here and I'll put some filler in here, um, everything will look fine. So you can really have them kind of start here so they all line up then really bulge out if you wanted to. or have a like a, um, a ramp up or all which I plan to do on my other pieces or something like that. Any form of detail can go on the actual board sections as long as the edges match up with each other. No problems at all. Okay, so I want to take a different uh, direction with this and actually have a bit of a hobby chat. Um, because I've recently shifted how I'm going to do a lot of the builds for the other board I'm working on, not this one, this is my test board. Um, and I'm going to move away from the Hearst Arts uh, models, and I'll explain why in a second, and move towards uh, these, which are the 3D printed options. So I was using Hearst Arts moulds, this is one that I've made myself because the others are indoors, um, to build these buildings. And I was uh, thoroughly not enjoying the process and hobby for me has taken a bit of a change recently. I decided to move away from having things look exactly perfect and how I want them um, and that being something that takes up a lot of time um, and causes me a lot of frustration um, and annoyance at a, lot, at a lot of times and move my entire hobby towards things that are a little bit easier to do and get me a good enough result that I'm happy enough with um, in a reasonable amount of time. And I think it's a shift in me becoming more happy with the hobby that I do put out um, rather than constantly being overly critical. So these pieces, while they look lovely, um, take a lot of time and effort um, to get anywhere close to a complete building. The 3D printed option, while not straightforward, um, takes less hands-on time. So to, for example, this piece um, it took 24 hours to print the base and 20 something hours to print the roof. So it took two days worth of printing. Um, however, that's hands off time. Hands on time was a learning process for me, so I won't really count that. Um, but uh, I think it's about 15 to 20 minutes work to get the files and process them and have them ready to print. Quite straightforward, it just runs in the background um, and um, you end up with a product you can get painting with. The Hearst Arts moulds, while absolutely fantastic, and this is not a criticism of the moulds or the process at all, it's just not for me, um, this took something in the region of five hours of hands-on work to cast the bricks, and that is not, uh, it, you couldn't spend five hours making them because you have to leave them to cure in the mould before you turn them out, uh, which you can go away and do something else during, um, but you know it takes maybe 15 to 20 minutes per cast of hands-on time to get everything ready um, and do the casting and the scraping and all the prep work. So it's very, very time consuming, plus a couple of hours to build. I didn't enjoy the building process because the blocks don't come out uh, machine perfect in their accuracy. Um, so there's a lot of difficulty in getting everything to fit. It's not like a plastic kit. And uh, the plaster is subject to chipping, even though I've used a good quality, fairly hard plaster. I've coated it in a layer of uh, very hard set wood glue. Um, there's still some chipping that takes place. Um, and final point that I'm not happy with this particular project about is this piece uh, weighs like one and a half kilos. Um, so it's very heavy. Um, whereas this weighs something like 200 grams. So it's super lightweight and not subject to chipping. So what I've actually done is I've sold on a lot of my Hearst Arts moulds and taken that money uh, and bought a 3D printer, just an entry level piece that I'm working to, to learn with. And so far, I mean, at table distance, 
they look about as good as each other. Obviously, there are loads of different options you can print out in the same way as there's loads of different unique ways to build the Hearst Arts pieces. So it will be a new venture for me in getting hobby stuff done for the table. Bigger pieces do take four or five days worth of printing to create them. However, it's not hands on time. It's sitting there doing it while I'm doing something else. Painting wise, uh, you can see the layer lines with 3D printing, this is what happens. However, they're very minimal and you have to get pretty close before you notice them. Um, at table distance, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell and it all comes down to the painting. These are wonderfully textured and it's very, very easy to paint them. These require a little bit more paint work and to get the, an equivalent result. Um, but I actually enjoy the painting more than I did the building. I found it very frustrating and, you know, uh, hobby and the creation of stuff is a good uh, mental health break and outlet for me. Um, I don't really want it being something that's constantly frustrating me. So I've decided to make an active change and move across to this. So there'll be a few more of these uh, coming into the build and uh, we'll see how it gets on. I've still got some moulds that I'm keeping for doing all the city tiling. Um, I've made my own wall mould, which I'm uh, still uh, churning out pieces for to make the walls. And uh, we'll see how things change. But uh, I think with hobby, you've got to find... Uh, what makes you most content in your hobby. If something is continually frustrating you, and I don't mean a short-term thing that you can work through and get over, you know, this is a long-term frustration for me and I'm disposed to be making something like 15 pieces for the board. Um, so it really wasn't a, a long-term option. So let's see how this works out. Right, I wanted to cap things off by taking a look at the practice board that I did and it's come out quite well. And what I've done is jazzed up an old Realm of Battle gaming board and I did this as a trial of all of the different processes that I wanted to use. So you can already see some of those Hearst Arts buildings here and all the flocking, etc. that's been done. And I did this as a practice and it's really, really worth doing, even if you just get a small scrap of wood and test everything out. Because I've managed to get in here and do a test on you know, the building and the painting, all the shrub work, the, the ground covers, etc. Uh, how I did the dirt underneath this and get everything nailed down and make notes about it all. So you get the materials that you want to use, uh, do a practice piece, like I made these practice trees, um, and I'll definitely be doing more of these, and I'll do a video to cover how I've assembled them. And it's really worth doing a practice board or a practice section so you can try everything out, because it's one thing to look at uh, videos on YouTube of people making terrain, and it's definitely another one to try it out for yourselves, because you may find that the materials you want to use don't work exactly, in the way they said or you want to do things differently and testing out is definitely worth the effort so outside of the city i'll be replicating this kind of ground look um, on the uh, outside pieces and i'll be making some trees that are like this maybe some a little taller um, to be scattered around in those holders that i showed before and the same with some scatter rocks and then all my ruined pieces will end up in a very similar gray scheme maybe mix a few browns in there as well and uh, doing a test like this teaches you what you do want to do and what you don't want to do. And I did this in order to sell on the piece um, because it really made me push myself to do a great job and get it exactly how I would want it on my board. So always, uh, always be willing to give things a try.